Helen Doyle is an expert in cultural heritage and she's also an environmental historian. She's tutored and lectured in Australia and presented at conferences around the world. Helen's literary output includes being assistant editor for the Oxford Companion to Australian history and she's developed a strong interest in the history and heritage of water supply within various cultural landscapes. So what does water supply symbolise in terms of our broader settlement history across Victoria. Will you please welcome Helen Doyle. Thanks and good evening. Water has left us with a rich heritage of diverse places, of linear paths through wide and varied expanses of country, of large reservoirs and smaller water supplies, of aqueducts, channels, private pumps, pipe tracks, pipe bridges, wells, tanks, storage towers, weirs, pumping stations, water meters, water level measuring equipment, filtration systems, treatment plants, water reserves, fountains, workers' camps, caretakers' houses, admin buildings, reservoir parks, picnic grounds, tourist facilities, forestry plantations, fire plugs, fire towers, private bores and windmills, weather stations and other tools of scientific research, and many, many more. All these many places constitute the tangible relics of our water supply history across Victoria. In Melbourne, these places are mostly concentrated to the east and north of the city. Tonight, I want to focus on how water supply sites are important as part of the historical fabric of the environment in which we live. What role has our water supply played in the course of our history? How have issues of white settlement history influenced the kinds of water supply places that have been built? and that we are left with today. I'm hoping to draw some connections between the particular story of local water supplies and the broader story of settlement. How has the harnessing of water both reflected broader themes of settlement history and at the same time shaped settlement itself? I will focus just tonight on a couple of themes in Victoria's broader history. Firstly, foundation and discovery, and secondly, the idea of appreciating the landscape as scenery. In working across historic themes, the story of water supply can be integrated with a more complex story of colonial progress, development and innovation, and in some cases of decline and decay. And appreciating the visual quality of water enables water to be captured, if you like, as a photo or a painting as part of the scenery of settlement. The first theme, discovery and foundation, or the role, or the role of water supply in the very of the role of water supply in the very self-conscious process of history making. The search for water and the finding and harnessing of it has often been a key factor in selecting the best place to settle and has left a legacy of places and stories associated with pioneering and surviving in this new country. The story of finding water is a key element in the stories that Europeans told about settling the land and in fact used to justify their right to settle on that land, on land that was already occupied. The availability of fresh water determined the sites of settlement, for example, at springs and river crossings. As Genevieve so, told so well, um, here we are in Melbourne, obviously, on the Yarra, um, and the site was chosen because of the falls, the proximity to the falls where the salt water met the fresh water, which provided settlers with two essential things, that of transport, um, access to shipping routes, and of fresh drinking water. The promise of progress and of abundant food and resources was the constant rhetoric of colonial politicians, and new water supplies were usually opened with due pomp and ceremony. Local water supplies then determined settlement sites, they determined town sites, transport routes, water-driven industries, and innumerable public reserves. As the frontier of settlement moved across the colony, each successive wave of settlers prayed for rain and for engineers. Yet while a new water supply promised much in terms of settlements and industries, it sometimes destroyed other places. The construction of Yan Yan Reservoir, for example, in 1857, destroyed um, an Aboriginal ceremonial ground, flooded the Aboriginal ceremonial ground. Other white settlements were also destroyed, for example, Old Talangatta, when the Hume Weir was built, all for the sake of improved water supply. Failed water supplies, too, are part of the story of the state's development sometimes victims of geography or bad engineering or both, and of declining population. 
As late as the 18, sorry, as late as the 1940s, one fifth of 180 towns across Victoria surveyed were found to have an inadequate and unsatisfactory water supply. The second theme I'll briefly discuss is this idea of the appreciation of the landscape. The idea of water as a thing of beauty. Underpinning this is a fundamental concept that probably stems from the idea that water essentially sustains life. Lakes, waterfalls, and even the water features that we have in our homes draw the eye and the senses. In the mid-19th century, the presence or otherwise of water significantly affected settlers' descriptions of the country that they found. Fertile, well-watered pastures were celebrated as a kind of promised land. The rapturous praise of Australia Felix by the explorer Major Mitchell suggested a land fit for immediate cultivation. Mitchell's intended settlers, however, were those accustomed to the regular and predictable rainfall of the British Isles. But Mitchell had been unaware that there had been an unseasonably high rainfall that year, in 1836, when his party had struggled across the sodden ground of Western Victoria, and his party, by the way, included a horse-drawn boat launch, which he hoped to use once he got to the water. Um, at the Wimmera River, Mitchell waxed lyrical about the rich green landscape. In fact, his party was standing at the margin of the driest rainfall belt in Victoria. Here, the natural water supply was not as it had seemed. Had it not rained so hard that year, the land would probably not have looked like it, would probably look more like it does today, and there would have been no myth of Australia Felix, and future governments might not have felt compelled to try to make the promise of a bountiful land of unlimited resources a reality, which I think it still struggles to do today. The evident lack of water in many parts of Victoria before the introduction of grand water supply schemes caused great despair amongst settlers. Dry country was abhorred as a useless wasteland. As William Westcarth found in the 1840s, it was disturbing country where even lakes could disappear. The same heavy melancholy mood associated with drooping gum trees was also triggered by an apparent absence of water. Quote, a district which has been rainless for a year or two years is a pitiful spectacle of desolation. The grass disappears, the wind carries with it whirling columns of dust. The trees of the dreary plain become more sombre and mournful than ever. This was not the place for a settlement. Adding water to the landscape, however, certainly made for a more palatable scene. At Healesville, there were plenty of mountains, but no sign of water, no sign of, of uh, a lake. Not, uh, there was obviously the Yarra. So the Self-Interested Local Progress Association sought in the 19, early 1900s to create the picturesque in order to attract more tourists. They proposed to construct a lake at the entrance to the town. While this never went ahead, the completion soon after of the Maroonda Lake or the Maroonda Dam in 1927, which provided Melbourne's homes with fresh mountain water, um, by the way, which was claimed to be the best in the world for many years, provided an unparalleled tourist boost to the town. A year later, 1928, Healesville attracted more tourists than any other town in Victoria, 10,000 visitors during the Easter holiday period. Various water supply sites satisfied a dual purpose of beauty and utility. The spectacle of Yan Yan Reservoir, completed in 1857, became an instant tourist attraction for a people deprived of lakes. Later, water-related tourist attractions included the Cascades at Wallaby Creek in the Plenty Ranges, which is now a Melbourne water um, restricted zone, but it was a tourist attraction in the 1880s. Um, there are extraordinary bluestone steps cut into the side of the ranges. Uh, Lake Eildon, later completed in the 1950s, was a ready-made tourist resort. It's sheer, sorry. Its sheer size stood as testament to the state's engineering prowess and promised a fail-proof supply for Victoria. On the opening of the Eildon Dam, the then Minister for Water Supply, Sir Henry Bolte, claimed that the new storage was guaranteed to provide an unfailing water supply for the future. Eildon was also celebrated for its picturesque or scenic values. Standing on the shore of Lake Eildon with his father in the film The Castle, Dale Kerrigan poses the rhetorical question, How's the serenity? The Kerrigans holidaying at Bonnie Doon found a pleasant stillness in the vast expanse of water. Some water supply places are lost or abandoned because of progress or disaster. For example, the empty storage basin currently at Preston, or the many miles of empty and now purposeless irrigation channels of the former fruit growing areas of northern Victoria. The water supply story in Victoria is, from one perspective, a grand narrative of progress and improvement. 
Because of this, the early, the early physical signs of water supply, such as water bags, barrels, water carts, are scarce. Small farm dams and local water storages leave some marks on the ground, but their reticulation systems are generally upgraded as a matter of course, and obsolete equipment and machinery routinely done away with. Much has been lost, has fallen victim to the need to upgrade, replace and make good. The original fresh water spring at Malvern, for example, in Melbourne's southeastern suburbs, was in the 1880s or so encased in a rustic grotto in a municipal park that borders on Spring Street in Malvern. But few re residents there today probably know the significance of this early site. Water supply places in Victoria have many meanings and associations. I hope that I've generated tonight some thoughts about the historical meanings that we make for places the ways in which we locate or see places in the landscape and the values we hold for those places. Thanks. <laughs>